Welcome. This is Holly with Teaching Tuesday, and it is September the 28th, and it is harvest time, y'all. So I have been out collecting. I hope you have been too. Thank you so much for joining me. And uh, today we're going to be delving into the amazing acorn and the incredible oak tree. There's over 600 varieties of oaks. Uh, we're only going to just focus on um, one of them right now, but um, they're all edible and they're all need to be processed. You can't just eat them raw. So I'll get into all of those details in a minute. But first, I just wanted to uh, welcome you and especially all you new members. Thank you so much for joining me. It's such a delight to see our group growing and spreading wildfires. And uh, this is all reclaiming common knowledge that used to be ours for the, for um, we just learned it for generations ever since the beginning of time. And so I feel very, very connected to be able to do the things I do and extremely overjoyed to be able to share it with others. So thanks for joining me. And thank you all for, for participating in the different contests this week. We did the apple recipe contest and um, I'll be sharing what I made in just a minute. <clears throat> but thank you all for participating in that. Maggie, those candied apples looked amazing and I can't even imagine grilling an apple fritter, but hey, that sounds good too. <laughs> so thanks Tracy for sharing that. And all of you that shared your foraging basket and the things that you're collecting, it was inspiring. All the way from California with Cindy Christ and the beautiful goldenrod um, essential oil with her. She has her own still. So she makes her own oils and she makes her own soaps and it's pretty awesome. So I hope you all checked out her pictures that she posted of that. And then she's going to send me a hydrosol, which I'll share with you all as well. She sells her things. So you're welcome to contact her. I can put her contact info in the comments. Um, let's see who else participated this week. So exciting. Susan, Suzanne, you just blow my mind with a uh, Carolina allspice leaves and tips, sassafras, sassafras roots, um, autumn olive berry, uh, lamb's quarter seeds, nettle. Can't imagine collecting nettle. I know I do collect the seeds at this time, but not the leaves. So let me know what you're doing with that. You said you're collecting mushrooms. What kind did you collect? Fennel and smartweed. Um, and Rachel, you posted the most beautiful picture of mushrooms and I found a lion's mane this week so I was super excited to find it but because I don't really know what to do with it I just thought well that's interesting so maybe you can let us know how you eat and partake of lion's mane this is definitely a horizon I have yet to learn but I'm excited about learning and I'm so glad you're in our group so I put all of the names of everyone who participated in the contest into the raffle generator and I will write down the winner so um, you could be entered three different times for the three different contests. And so all of those names were put in sometimes multiple times. So Deanna, you are the winner. Thank you so much for sharing your um, recipe for making apple cider vinegar from scratch, which is such a wonderful thing to do. It costs nothing because you're using your scraps from the apples that you all are collecting and making your apple recipes with. So it's just such a wise thing to do. So I'm proud of you. And thank you for sharing that with all of us. So you'll get to come foraging with me and we'll just probably be getting more nuts because this is the season and you harvest for what's on nature's wave at the time. And so right now there's just all kinds of nuts and I'll be sharing with you what those are. There's some seeds that are out. Um, so much to tell you about those things, but I really want to focus on just the acorn. So let's talk about that. Um, Real quick, let's see. So our wild drink, which is, oh, I always do a wild drink. I was gonna make an acorn coffee. And the way you do that is you just roast the grits that I have, I'll show you how I go through this process. But I didn't get a chance to roast them. And so I decided I'll share with you instead what I found at, believe it or not, Trader Joe's. So this was so exciting. <laughs> Remember when we learned all about elderflower? This is elderflower lemon soda, and it was on the shelves at Trader Joe's, so I was like freaking out, and I bought a package of it, and so I'm going to sample it now. Jason, would you like to try some? I would like it, yes, please. Okay. So, ooh, boy. It has that elderflower smell to it. 
And you can stay up here because I'm going to serve Just you some little, crumble. Why don't you tell us about what you did for the wild? <laughs> he did the wild cooking demonstration, although um, because we have so much to cover here. Uh, cheers. Cheers. Um, here's to elderflower <laughs> mm. in September. It has a real good citrusy, tangy taste because it's got lemon in it. I think it's very it's, It tastes tasty. like elderflower. Well, I think it's tasty. The lemon helps it. Right? Yeah, I love this. This would definitely be my go-to soda. Mm, but okay. we don't have a Trader Joe's near us. Okay, so what did we make? Yeah. So, Here up in front. Yes. What did, what did they call this? Do you it's remember? It's an apple crumble, but we made it with acorn flour and apples, which were apples that we Max and I foraged for all over the high country. So I'll go ahead. You tell us what you put in it, and I'll start... I'll serve you some. Okay, so um, first you have to wet, cut your apples and wedge them and so forth, get them cleaned up and get them ready. You don't have to uh, dice them or, or cut them up any more than just in nice clean wedges. You put them into the baking dish with a mixture of some brown sugar and ginger and cinnamon and... A little bit of lemon. A little bit of lemon, yeah. And uh, then you make the crumble out of some flour, some uh, brown sugar, brown sugar, thank you, brown sugar, pecans, pecans, yes, very much, and so. butter. So then you just take the flour mixture and spread it over the baking dish and uh, and the apples in there, and that gives you your crumble, I guess it's called. So we're gonna we're gonna well, try some. Yeah, crumble. I'm gonna give it to you, but I can't find the thing to pull it out of the. Uh, oh, you're you're trying here. To... I'll just use a um That's a spoon. Fine. That's fine. Do it into a bowl, maybe. Now, ideally, I think this particular dessert is best with vanilla ice cream. Don't have any tonight, but we're going to enjoy trying it anyway. I better get a spoon over here so I can eat it. Well, I want to see you. You've got to show everybody what it tastes like. <laughs> so, wait, got... wait, 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 wait. There's some pecans. So, like, what you're supposed to do is put ice cream on there, vanilla ice cream, of can course. You see, can you picture vanilla ice cream on With top? a little bit of pecans. And yeah. if I had the acorns all fixed up, we could have done acorns. Oh. I just used acorn flour. Mmm. Mmm. The apples are perfectly done. It cooked, cooked it for, for 50 minutes. 50 minutes at 350. Mm -hmm. And the... Uh, all of the different crumble sauce with it. Oh, it's 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 terrific, I think. Wow. And boy, that acorn flour really makes it. <laughs> Sorry, I had to put that plug in. Well, mm. I didn't use all acorn flour. I used maybe a third of acorn flour, and then the other two-thirds were cassava flour, which is gluten-free. Mm. So there's no gluten in that. Mm. So there's no gluten in acorns either. Need some coffee. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it goes with coffee. So just pretend mm. you're having acorn coffee. Max is right down here. He's waiting for his his yeah. turn too. Make sure you save him a bite. Okay. All right. Thank you, honey, for joining us. All right. So I wanted to share with you um, about some the, our new Bible verse. And as I was studying oaks in the scriptures, it was absolutely fascinating to me all the different times that the word oak um, was brought up. The oak tree. So I'm just going to read a few of them to you and see if you can see like a theme in here. And then I'll teach you our new Bible verse that we'll be memorizing together. So here's the oak trees in scripture. In Genesis 12, 6, it said, Abram traveled through the land as far as the sacred place at Shechem at the Oak of Murrah. So they used an oak as like a destination or as a, a place like the Oak of Murrah. So it's a landmark. So think about is there an oak from your childhood that was just enormously bigger than life to you? Because they are bigger than life. They, they can sometimes grow up to be a thousand years old. Um, they can be as wide as they are tall and they have such huge leaves that they make such a shady, wonderful um, place for to, to commune together underneath the oak tree. So Abram traveled to the Oak of Morah. And here's another one in Genesis 13, 18. Um, so Abraham packed his tent and went and settled by the Oaks of Mamre in Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. So he built an altar to the Lord under the Oak of Memory, Mamre. And then in Genesis 18, 1, the Lord appeared to Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre, same place, while he sat at the entrance of this, his tent in the day's heat. So God showed 
presented himself to Abraham under the oaks. And then um, in Joshua 19.33, it says their border ran from Heloth, from the oak in Zenam, and Zebaniel as far as Lachem, and it ended at the Jordan River. So they used it as they used big, huge oaks as a boundary, which I think is interesting, a border. And then here in Joshua 24, 26, it says, Joshua wrote these words in God's instruction scroll. Then he took a large stone and put it up there under the oak in the sanctuary of the Lord. So it was used for sacred purposes. And then this one I love in Judges 6, 11, the Lord's messenger came and sat under the oak at Ophrah that belonged to Joash. And his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And so an angel of the Lord came to meet with Gideon and commissioned him there under the oak at um, Ophrah. And this was a weird one in 2 Samuel 18, 9. It says, Absalom came under upon some of David's men. Absalom was riding on a mule, and the mule went under the tangled branches of a very large oak tree, and Absalom's head got caught in the tree. He had long hair. And he was left hanging in midair while the mule under him kept right on going. <laughs> so can you picture that? It had a really creepy end, so I won't read that. And then in Isaiah 6, 13, it says, An oak which when it is cut down leaves a stump and its stump is a holy seed. Because if the root is there, it'll keep coming. It might be coppiced, but it will keep coming. And so when I think of an oak, actually, if you could comment and tell me what you think of when you think of oaks, what adjectives do you use to describe an oak? Or what kind of a reputation do you think an oak has? What kind of, um, what do you, what comes to mind? And, and when I think of an oak, I think of uh, solid and enduring and um, stable and generous. So write down what you think. Um, and also just let me know that you're here. I love it when you guys comment. I, you're probably gonna have questions. Make sure you question, I'll answer each question and I'll definitely respond to each comment as well. Okay, and then our memory verse for today is right here. It says, they will be called Oaks of Righteousness, the planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. And so I just love the idea of God wanting us to be like an oak, being solid and strong and enduring and persistent and having deep root structures and uh, to display his splendor and to display his glory. I just think that's awesome. So that'll be our verse for acorns. They will be called oaks of righteousness, which means right standing with God. So oaks, you know, solidly rooted in his love and founded securely on God's love. And then it says the planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. So go ahead and print that out and decorate it with all kinds of oak leaves. There are over 600 species, so you don't have to do all 600 leaves, but they're all different sizes and shapes, but there are some similarities, which we'll go over in a minute. Um, the, uh, so those are our wild thoughts. And I want to talk now about befriending acorns or befriending oaks so that you get to really know what to do with this amazing bounty because it's coming down now and not always. This is the interesting thing about acorns and a lot of nut trees is that they don't always have a mast year. A mast means a large yield. Sometimes it'll take two years where there are no acorns that drop at all. And sometimes that has to do with the weather, if it's been too much rain or too much drought or something, the, the tree will be a little traumatized and it will keep its energy to itself without being generous and dropping the, the acorns. So this year is a mast year and it's such a delight to me to go out to my different oak trees and to know that there's just going to be tons of them. Interestingly, though, I've found very few red acorns, red oaks, uh, acorns, I found a lot of the white acorns. So that was fascinating to me. Um, so let's talk about the difference between the two and I'll show them to you really quick. And then we're gonna get into how you process acorns so that you can turn it from something beautiful as something um, lovely or something you could twist an ankle on <laughs> into something absolutely delicious and nutritious and an absolute superfood. This is probably one of the most important um, 
gifts that God could give us because it's so high in starch and carbohydrates. And one of the conundrums of a forager is that we don't have very many starchy or carbohydrate rich foods that we can gather for free. But acorns are very high in starch and carbs, and uh, but they don't have gluten and they are extremely good for you as far as the glycemic index, which is amazing how low it is and how filling they are. So we'll get into that when we talk about its gifts of edibility. But right now, let's just talk about what do you look like. So here I've got some trees, some branches. So here we've got, um, this is a red oak. And there's many, many different kinds of red oaks. And I honestly don't know what kind this one is. But boy, these leaves get e enormous. So let's just talk about what they look like. So first of all, the branching is alternate. You see that they're not opposite one another, they're alternate. And the lobes are very pointy in a red oak. So, um, and these things get absolutely huge. And it's so interesting because I collected these along my hiking habit. And I've watched these little tiny buds, the leaf buds leaf out into these little tiny, uh, I've been showing pictures ever since we started class last spring of these oak leaves beginning to burgeon out and unfurl and then watching them get bigger and bigger until they're just enormous. And then um, here's another one that's a different, you can tell this is a completely different um, type of a red oak. Do you see how much deeper those lobes are than these? This one's a little fatter and it doesn't have as deep of a lobe. So I'm not, I've decided I don't really care um, what species it is because I don't have time for that, but I do know that all acorns are edible if you process them properly. So I'll teach you how to do that processing today for sure. So the red oaks have um, these pointy lobes like we talked about. They also have um, rounded nuts. So here I'll show you what the nuts look like. Look at how round those nuts are and they have kind of a flat bottom. And these little caps are very scaly. And if you take the cap off, they're a little bit hairy on the inside or that's called glabrous. Um, so I didn't find a whole lot of red oaks because this is not a mashed year for the red oaks. Sometimes that's like every other year for the red oaks. Anyway, so I, um, they're round and also they dry faster. So you could write that down. They dry faster than the white and um, Let's just talk about those same exact uh, things concerning the white acorn. So here's the white acorn. And what do you notice differently here? Do you see how rounded these lobes are? And then deeply, um, the sinuses are quite deep. This one is a white oak. And there's a little tiny acorn on there. And this is called a Cecile acorn. Don't I won't get into those kind of details, but those are some of the ways that you can tell the difference between the different types of white oaks. Um, if you notice the, here's another white oak, they tend to be oblong or longish, the acorns, as compared to the rounded ones of the red oaks. See how round that is compared to these long kind of oblongish type of white oak acorns. Okay, so what else do they say? Um, these dry, the white oaks dry a lot slower, which you're going to see in a minute how that makes a difference than the red acorns. And they also, um, interestingly enough, when they drop to the ground, they will germinate immediately upon hitting the ground within a few days in the fall. Whereas the red acorns, when they drop in the fall, they do not germinate until the spring. And so you, if you gather these, which I just gathered these the other day, if you gather up white acorns, you need to process them immediately. So let's talk about processing right now. Oh, before that, I wanted to say this, that one out of 10,000 acorns will actually sprout and become a tree, which is interesting to me. Okay, so here's the steps. So I, I'm going to, I did a, a little slideshow for you, which will have all of this reiterated so you can see it up close and personal, but I just wanted to tell you here right now. So the first thing you do is you identify the tree, which we talked a little bit about, and you wanna identify them. Probably the best way to identify them is when you see the acorns. So when you're walking and you're just letting God 
just um, stimulate your senses, all five senses in nature, and you see the beauty around you, and you hear the birds, and you feel the wind, and you are stepping on little acorns, and you go, oh my gosh, there they are. And they usually come down in September uh, into October, and even into November. But there's an early drop, which we'll talk about in a minute, which is not a good thing. And then there's the good drop. And the good drop is when you find quite a bit in one spot. And I'll talk about the difference. So the first thing you want to do is gather them and you can sort them. And what you do, I like to sort as I go. So I honestly don't have a bad acorn here to show you because I don't like to waste my time sorting later. I like to sort as I go. So I'll have a satch or like a basket with me or I'll have a my little belt with a, a forging bag on it or um, milk carton or whatever you've got. And so you just look and see, does it have any holes in it? If it does, it has a weevil, an oak weevil, which it ate from the inside out. So that means there, the nut meats are destroyed. So don't even bother putting that into your basket. Um, there's a lot of other things that you can determine whether it's a good acorn or a bad acorn. But one of the ways you can determine that is just by throwing them all into a gallon of water, five gallons of water. And the ones that float are probably um, not dense enough because they've been eaten up with a larva inside or there's some type of a um, problem in there. So those you just scoop off and throw them away. And the ones that sink to the bottom are the ones you want to deal with. All right, the first thing I do is I freeze them. And the reason why I freeze them right away is because I usually don't have time to process right away. And if you're not going to process right away, then freeze them in a bag. And the reason why is because there might be some eggs or little young larva in these perfectly beautiful acorns that you could kill off. And they're really high in protein, so it doesn't bother me if I get any of those in there, but you can tell when you're shelling later if there is a problem. I just freeze them until I'm ready. Then I take all of them out and I put them into my dehyde. I then dry them. So step two after freezing, and you don't have to freeze, you could go right to the drying stage, is I dry them in my dehydrator so these are all dried and ready to go. And the reason why you wanna dry them is because they're a lot easier to shell if you dry them first. You can dry them in a low oven, you can dry them outside, but if you leave them outside, the um, squirrels will get them. And so you need to, if you're gonna leave them outside in the sunshine, make sure you have a net over them, or you could put them in your car as long as they're like on the dashboard or something where the sun can bake them and dry them out. Once they're dry, step three, is you're going to shell them, which is what I was doing when I was herbing around when class started. And so there's lots of different ways you can take um, people, indigenous people used to do the most fascinating things. And I put a picture of this in your slideshow of how they have these huge rocks that they would grind the acorns and crack them with another rock and it would actually make holes in the rock. They're called grinding holes. I'll never forget going to Mission Gorge. Um, Cindy, I wish I could have gone there with you. I bet you go there all the time in San Diego and you could see the beautiful, um, it's such a beautiful area, but the live oaks are everywhere there. And so they would, um, the, the Indian women would spend a lot of time grinding these acorns and you could see the holes in the rocks that were sometimes down to two to four or five inches. So after I got the meat out, I then take the shell and I drop it in the water. Why do I do this? You'll learn about this when we talk about medicine in a little bit. I put the nuts also in the water as well. And why do I do that? Because the nut meat will oxidize if you don't immediately put it into water. So I did that. And so this is the kind of thing that you wanna have lots of kids to do because you can just keep your kids, kids busy <laughs> because this takes a lot of time. But I love using just a nutcracker and they're really easy. They've got a very um, flexible shell. They're not hard. Like look at these hard shells of the walnut or look at the hard shells of the hickory nut um, or the butternut that's even harder so these are super easy and very um easy to get open a lot of people like to take hammers and put them on top of a rock with a uh, like a cloth over it whoops now that has do you see how that has a little bit of brown on the inside so i'm not going to use that one because it looks like 
it has a problem. So that's a bad acorn. That's the first bad one I've found after doing quite a few. Okay, so, um, so after you shell them and um, you've got them in the water like this, then you strain off the water and put them into your food processor or you can grind them um, like the, the Indians did with the rocks. You can do that or like in a pestle and mortar or I like to put it in my food processor because it's a lot quicker. <laughs> so I just put, I just got rid of the water and I put all of these nuts into the food processor and I have pictures of this in my slideshow to just make it into a meal, M-E-A-L. Then I cover it. Then the next step is leaching. Then you cover it. There's three ways to leach. The cold leaching is covering it with cold water. And when I first did that, this the water turned out almost black or just a really dark brown. It's because of the tannins that are in the acorns. And the tannins are extremely astringent and really um, uh, makes your mouth pucker like... If you ever, if you were to taste one of these nut meats right now, you would you would think, Holly, these are disgusting. Why do people rave over acorns, and why was it such a a staple for so many centuries for all of mankind? You know, because it's disgusting. Well, these tannins are water soluble, and you can leach them out of the acorn by just putting them in cold water. So you put them in the cold water, and you cover. So you can see them. You can see the. Do you see my uh, grits at the bottom, my meal? And then you pour it off, and I'm not going to bother doing that right now, into the sink. You pour it off into the sink, and then you fill it up again. And so maybe two, three, four, five times a day, you just pour it. But you're just pouring off the water. You're not letting any of the Right, grits but what I, what I like to do, hold on, because that is a little bit tricky, is I like to use... Um, I like to use my little sieve like this. So as I'm pouring this off, and you can save this water too, because you want this nutri nutrient dense tannic liquid uh, for reasons we'll talk about in a minute. But you could pour it off through here because I don't like to lose any of these. And then just put it, put it back in, fill it up with water. And after four to five days of doing that, two to three, four times a day, this water gets clearer and clearer, and it's not really the water you're looking for, it's the taste. So I tasted these and they tasted bland and nutty and good. And so these are ready to go. So what I did with them then is I, the next step after you have um, leached them. Oh, and let me tell you a fun way you can leach. Now, Jason and I've tried many ways, but one time we'd actually put them in a baggie in like a mesh bag, thin mesh, like a laundry bag and put it in our toilet tank, not toilet bowl, but the toilet tank. And every time you would flush it, it would just rinse the tannins down the drain. And I didn't find that to be all that effective. But what the Indians used to do is they would put, put it in a basket that was tightly woven in a stream and let the stream just constantly run over these nut meats so that it would just clean out the tannins in that way, which I think is an amazing way to do. And if I was next to a stream, I would do that for sure. Although I would be afraid that the squirrels would get them. Okay. Um, so then once these have been leached, the next thing you do is you dry them again. And this time you dry them in like the dehydrator or the oven or, or in the car, any way you want until these mealy grains are dry. They haven't been roasted. They're just dry. And they're ready to be put into a coffee maker, a coffee grinder like this. Or if you have a whisper mill, I would love to have a flour mill. That would be amazing. But, you know, if you don't have a flour mill. Um, who, was she, who was she looking at when she I said I was looking that? at you. But anyway, it, uh, you can get a hand grinder uh, as well for flour, which, which could be a good thing if we ever didn't have electricity. But um, anyway, I like using my coffee grinder and you get it really thin and um, fine like this and you can do it as fine as you want and I'm, I'm guessing that a whisper mill would make it a lot finer than what I was able to come up with once you have this you've got flour f-l-o-u-r and it is so nutrient dense and so good for you we'll talk about what it does for you in just a second let me make sure I've got everything so we went through all of the steps did all of that make sense to you guys now the these um I used to think 
I've been learning so much. There's so much out there. And honestly, guys, I have to just give um, kudos to Samuel Thayer because he has an entire section in his book called Nature's Garden on acorns, which is the most complete um, information I've ever seen. It must be like 50 pages. Samuel Thayer's Nature's Garden. He's probably the forager's forager. I mean, I don't think I ever should write a book. When there's somebody like him out there, no one needs Holly. I'll tell you, this guy is amazing. So um, I would get this book for all of the plants, but the ones on the acorns in here will blow your mind. And I am just touching the surface of the things he was able to discuss in great detail in this book. And it's so fascinating to plant geeks like us, right guys? All right. Um, once they are dried like this, so these are all dried and ready to go. These have all been cured. It's called cured. These are not. See these? These are waiting to be put in the oven on a single layer and just, or in my dehydrator and dried like I dry, dried these. Once they're like this, you can put them into paper sacks or into cardboard boxes and you, they will stay up for 10 years. Now that is food sustainability in my opinion. You've got some serious protein. Let's talk about that. It has complete protein, which means it has the eight amino acids that our body cannot produce on their own that make the complete chain of the protein that our body must have in order to survive and thrive. So it has that. It's high in vitamin Bs all the way up to the B12s. It's really good for heart health, for cholesterol. It's amazing. And this glycemic index is so, so low. And uh, it's such a tasty, tasty food. It has kind of a um, mapley um, molasses almost flavor to it. Um, could you taste it in your... Yeah, yeah, to me it had kind of an acorn taste. <laughs> well, okay. So, yes, it has an acorn taste. But that's the kind of taste that that has, and, it, and it's just delicious. You can do all kinds of things with it. You can make pancakes. You can make grits or porridge. You can make cookies. You can make cakes. You can make apple crumbles like we just did. Um, you can use it any way you would use flour. You can also use it just as a nut. So that's what I'm going to do with these. Do you see how these guys here are um, are absolutely whole. I haven't ground them yet. I'm going to hot leach these. And this is another way you can leach is you can put them in hot water and boil them. And then the water will be just black. You just strain that off, fill it up again, boil it again. And you do that five or six times, only takes a couple of hours and you've gotten rid of the tannins in there and you're ready to go. So that's probably the easiest way to do it. But I've never done that. So I'm going to try that this week. And you don't need to have it ground down like this. You need to do this if you're going to cold leach. You need to make them into ground in your food processor. If you're going to just hot leach, you can do them just like this. Like this, I'm going to use them just like a nut. So nut brittles, I'm going to make a nut brittle with it. I can use it for any way you would use any other nut, like pecans or hickory nuts or chestnuts or whatever. So that's exciting. I'm even going to try to make almond, I mean, acorn butter, but I would use these to do that with. So I'll let you know what I learned about that. If you've done hot leaching, let me know in the comments because I could learn from you. I would be very interested in learning about what you guys have done with that. All right. Um, I feel like I'm missing something. All right. So I hope that helps you appreciate the, the gift of its edibility. So let's talk about its medicinal gifts. This is the most amazing uh Plant, um, gift this astringent water in here it makes a fabulous wash for gargling if you have a sore throat or if you have loose gums it will it's because of the astringency in this water it will tighten up those gums um, it is good for sores or cuts or scrapes you could just wash your you know use this as a wash to really clean it out and to help things your cells regenerate um, it's also good. Let me just read to you some of the things it's good for medicinally, because honestly, I've never really used the oak for medicinal purposes. And I'm so fascinated about what I'm learning about that. So let's see.
So it's good for skin health, like I said. Um, it's got a lot of fiber in it, so that's really helpful for digestion. Let me read to you what it says about diabetes. Prevention, one of the most important benefits of acorns is their ability to regulate sugar levels in the body. The fiber content and relatively complex carbohydrates found in these nuts are the reason for this regulatory benefit. Heart health, because it improves cholesterol balance and prevents obesity and arthrosclerosis. Is that where your veins get clogged? Whatever. Okay, energy levels, longer lasting energy reserves, not because it's not empty carbs or simple sugars. It gives longer sustained energy boost than for most nuts. So, and it has all of the bees in there. So that's incredible for metabolic activity, for healing, repair, and growth because of the proteins. Um, it's important for the creation of new tissues and cells, as well as the repair of damaged areas and um, healing after injury or illness. And the Bach flower for oak is to restore endurance, which I think is super cool because remember we were talking about the reputation and how it has this enduring quality. And then useful or playful. So let's talk quickly about that. Um, it makes a great ink. And the most astringent part of the oak tree are the galls. And the galls are made by a certain type of wasp that lays its egg on the twigs of the oak tree. And then the oak just kind of grows around it. Those galls are super high in astringency. And um, they make the best dye. You don't even need to use a mordant if you use that. And I saw a really cool video on that. If you're interested in dyeing, I'll send that to you in the comments below. Um, you can use it for ink or for dye. The wood is extremely valuable. It's hard and it's heavy and it's strong. It's tough. It's close grained. It's durable, um, used for making furniture and for building ships. Green oak, that is unseasoned green oak, was invaluable for ship making. 2,000 mature oak trees were used to build one ship in 1812. <laughs> good grief. And then it's really good for animal feed, especially pigs, oaks, um, other great asset with its seed, better known as acorns, was from ancient times and throughout the medieval period, pigs were moved into pasture woodland to feed on acorns in the autumn. And um, they would calculate the value of a woods according to the number of swine that they would support, which indicates oaks was the commonest tree. Um, the right to graze pigs is known as panage, was often keenly disputed and jealously guarded. It meant that large oak forests were maintained because of their acorn crop. So it's kind of a fun way to feed your pigs for free. Um, and then, of course, the environment, the, the squirrels, the birds, the other animals that make their homes in the oak tree branches. Um, and the animals will store and squirrel away these acorns and the underground to save them for the seasons when other food sources are scarce. And sometimes they'll forget those treasures. And that is what leads to more oak trees. Um, all right. So let's talk quickly about the early drop and then we'll do our video or our, our slideshow. When the acorns drop and they're green, so here's, here's one that's green. That's a premature acorn. But I've noticed that it will turn brown just sitting here on my counter. And when I opened it up, it looks like a perfectly beautiful kernel inside. So I'm not worried about that. But mature acorns are typically tan and they often fall during the months of September and October. Well, an early acorn drop doesn't always indicate a serious problem with the trees. It can mean that the tree is struggling. If a tree is dropping green acorns this time of year, stress is probably a factor. If the cost of continued energy expenditure for seed production is too much, then the tree may abort and drop all of the acorns in their current state. So one of the ways that you can tell if it's not ready to go is if the cap doesn't come off. So that's another indication that you have a bad acorn because they should just drop right off the caps. Another thing I love to do with the caps and with the acorns is I love to save them and use them for making forest folk or little forest creatures, using them for crafts. It's amazing what you can do with acorns and with oaks for crafts. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at our slideshow, which will show you what I did this week. And so I show you where I was foraging, what kind of fooling around Max and I did. I did some fooling around with the uh, pain kids, Eli and Gideon and Ben and their big kid, their mom, Amy was climbing a maple tree. And um, 
we just had so much fun. We played hug a tree together, which is something I used to do with my boys when they were little. And um, there was this beautiful forest. And the way you find the tree is you blindfold a, one of the one of the people, one of the kids, and then you take them by the hand and you lead them to a tree of your choosing and you help them to see it with their fingers, with how wide around they can hug it. They feel up as high as they can, down low. They feel for roots. They feel for, you know, all kind, anything they can, um, rocks at the bottom, anything that they can figure out with their fingers being their eyeballs. And then um, they, we take them back to where we started, turn them around, take the blindfold off and say, go find your tree. So that was really fun. You'll see a few pictures of that. I also put some pictures of the wedding rehearsal dinner that Maggie Russell, love you, Maggie, and I um, did the flowers for. And um, all of it was free. It was just a matter of gathering and then with her expertise de decorating and everything turned out so beautiful. And then I showed you some of the apple preparations I did this week. I did a lot of jams and jellies this week. I did wild grape, I did wild um, autumn olive berry, I did um, crab apple jelly and I made applesauce. So all of that is kind of a self-explanatory if you just watch the video and then we'll come back and I'll share with you a few things you should be doing this week to make the most of harvest.
ready? Okay. So that gives you a little bit of an idea what I was doing. But honestly, guys, the busier I am, and it's been a really busy week, and it's been a hard week. There's been some real tragedy in our community where a, a beloved little 11 year old boy was killed um, yesterday. So today was just really hard and it will be for quite a while for our whole community that are just grieving his loss. And it was just a, it was an accident, kind of a freak accident. So um, please pray for the Kennedy family. Um, so <clears throat> no matter how busy you are, the busier you are, you must spend time alone with God and to get be still and know that he is God and that he is um, the answer to our fears. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out all fear. And so the more time I spend by the creek or hiking in the woods and um, observing his handiwork, the more peace I feel because I know I'm not alone and I can soak God in from the outside in and I can look at what he's created and realize the one who made this, the one who made me and sustains me, he's got this. He's got you. He loves you. And um, anyway, so I believe that he gets a kick out of me as I forage around and as I gather from his grocery store, and I think he gets a kick out of you too. And so I hope this week that you're gathering the nuts and the fruits and the seeds that are out there to gather. So let me just give you a few things that you should be getting. I would definitely be looking for the black walnuts and we'll do a whole class on this because this requires an entire class. And this is really good food. And I found butternuts this week, which uh, was extremely exciting to me. Catherine Arnold, finally, I found butternuts. I've never even seen these before. And there was just a plethora of them. And this really precious family that just said, yes, come take as much as you want. So I'm going to, but you have to cure them. And so if you cure these nuts properly, like I just taught you how to cure and dry these acorns to last a decade, then you're going to have some sustainability for your food supplies and it's free. So I really recommend that. I always take with me some wild jam or jelly. This is crab apple jelly. Look how beautiful that is um, to give to whoever's property I'm asking permission to forage on. And I've only been told no twice out of hundreds of times that I've asked permission to forage for acorns or weeds or whatever. Um, so it's worth getting to meet new people. I made some new friends. It was just really wonderful. So there's the um, butternuts. Of course, the acorns, see whether or not you've got red oak or white oak, what kind you have. Let me know. I'd love to know. Just keep gathering the apples. Apple season is not a month. It's three months. It's all of September, a little bit of October, August, all of October, and into some of November. Um, I, can, I made, I want to tell you quickly what to do. Um, the crab apple, I got lots of these. Crab apple makes the best base for fruit leathers. So I made lots of fruit leather this week. So delicious. And, but if you make fruit leather just out of autumn olive berries, it doesn't have the thickness to it. And I didn't want to add gelatin. So what I did is I just added some, the, ju the juice I used was crab apple juice, which is that high pectin. So none of my jellies, I had to use any gelatin with at all. I just had to I'll put the recipes for how I did it, but it's just super simple. It's just sugar and the fruit and the crab apple water. And you bring that to a really st stiff boil until it has, it kind of sheets off of your spoon. And if you're a jelly maker, you know what that means. Okay, so make, make, make apple butter, uh, make more apple recipes, share them with us. I'll have different posts where you can share in the comments so we can keep it from blowing up. And that would be a great way to be a part of our contest. So another great way to preserve is to dry the apples. And so I really recommend that. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you in time, but the beech tree um, and their delicious little nuts, which are kind of hard to open, um, but they're a tasty treat are, um, I think they're past. So like I said, foraging is highly seasonal. And if you don't gather it when the getting is good, they're gone. So, um, but that is one thing you could be looking for. What else? You'll be looking for hickory nuts. I'll be doing a whole class on hickories. Such a fascinating story. 
um, definitely you're going to want to get um, chestnuts. And those are not quite out yet. And here's the Buckeyes. And so I had a huge drop of Buckeyes from this one tree. I was there one day and there was only two or three Buckeyes at the foot of the Buckeye tree. The next day they had all dropped. And so this, remember, is the first tree that leaves out in the spring into its five lobed fingers. And this is the first tree to drop their, their leaves as well. So I'm going to be using these Buckeyes for crafts and for different things that have nothing to do with eating because they are toxic. They're so beautiful and they're so much fun to open up and see how many are inside of the husk. These look very, very similar to the acorn or to the chestnut that's inside of these chestnut husks. They're like porcupines, except for there's a big difference. So I'll teach you that when we do a class on chestnuts. Um, but you can collect these because they're really fun to play with. You can do games, and they're um, but they're not edible. There's some usefulness for fishing, though. Um, all right. The contest this week. Memorize the verse. I'll read it to you again. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that to display for the display of his splendor. So I want personally to display his splendor with my branches, with my life. And honestly, to tell you the truth, I look at hidden treasure or wild blessings as kind of like planting an acorn. And it's like, um, it's a small thing to do what I do and teaching you guys every week. But I feel as though I'm planting that acorn. And my vision is that this will become an oak of righteousness that will bring shade and comfort to people who gather and who will feed lots and lots of different animals and birds and um, provide lots of acorns for good food and laughter. And um, I just, that's kind of my vision for wild blessings. So I wanted to share that. So we've got the verse to memorize. Um, I want you to gather nuts and post what it is you're doing with your acorns and what kind of acorn um, recipe you're using. Next week, I have Kim Chastain coming to teach us how to make sourdough acorn bread, and that'll be fun. Also, next week is going to be extremely important because we're going to be talking about preserving for the winter and um, preserving for emergencies because there can always times when there are power outages, whether they're um, something, it's never anything we ever plan. So we'll be having somebody hopefully on that can help us with some ideas on how to be better prepared not fearful, but prepared. And so gather your nuts. You don't have to know how to open a butternut, how to open a black walnut, how to open a hickory. You don't have to know how to cook with them. Just gather them so that you've got them because once they're down off the tree, then they don't last long because of the squirrels and, and the other bears and stuff. So I hope this was an informative class for you. I hope you've been learning along with me and I love uh, participating with you in this wild adventure and share share this uh share this class yeah share this class with your friends by the way if you invite them to join please let them know the, uh, what you've invited them to because a lot of times i will reach out to somebody who's been invited and go thank you for joining they'll go who are you so let them know what it is you've invited them to and deanna i can't wait to go foraging with you so the the winner of this coming week will also get to go foraging with me because there's so much to forage for and we'll have so much fun. And coming up soon in the end of October will be a Forge to Feast, which will be our last one for the season. So God bless you. Please join me on Patreon and support Jason and I and Max if you can. And that would be really appreciated. And please pray for the Kennedy family.